was among the world's top lightweights. He agreed to a 2,000 pound purse to fight New Zealand's boss Murphy and warmed up by smashing old rival Vic Calto. Boswell boss Murphy, the rangy tailor, was said to be the fastest Kiwi fighter in years. He was also big enough to become Empire middleweight champion a couple of years later. Murphy was 22, Patrick 26. Such was Patrick's reputation that he and his family received a stylish reception upon their arrival in Wellington. 13,000 New Zealanders were behind Murphy on April 27, 1946 at the Batoni Sports Ground. Murphy was eight pounds heavier and a head taller than Patrick and he used his size advantage to the full, constantly smothering him and thwarting Patrick's punishing left cross. He was one of the strongest fighters ever met. He was big and strong. So he was tall. I think he'd lean over top of you. So I was only about five foot, I'm only about five foot six. The tactics work well, although in round seven, Murphy tried to mix it with Patrick and caught one on the chin. In the closing rounds, Patrick tried desperately to end it, but to no avail. The referee declared Murphy the winner amidst wild cheering, but trainer Ern McQuillan was livid. Well, I, I couldn't tell you the exact words he said. I get, I, get, I get put in the slammer. Patrick returned home and was soon back on the winner's list. In March, he knocked out the world-class American Eddie Marcus in just 80 seconds. Patrick's ultimate battle came on September the 1st, 1947, against Chicago's Freddie Dawson. Patrick was rated number five lightweight in the world, Dawson number eight. A victory for Patrick would give him a big chance to clinch the world lightweight title fight, which his army of fans believed he could win. After a shaky start, Vic came back swinging. But by the 12th, Patrick, ahead on points, was looking exhausted, and Dawson knew it and went in for the kill. Referee Joe Wallace should have stopped it there, but the fat man always liked to give the crowds a fight to the finish. For three minutes, Patrick lay unconscious until Ern McQuillan carried him from the ring. The crowd cheered their hero to a man. The fights against bigger blokes had worn him out. He had three more bouts after Dawson, but was never the same terrifying force. Yet, he could still punch. Mickey Tullis fought a 15-round draw with Patrick in 1948, and the memory still hurts. He'd been a trouble catching me for a while. <laughs> because he was a terrific puncher, Vic Patrick. A terrific puncher. And, uh... He was very really awkward to fight. He was the only one ever to hit me and lift me off the canvas. I thought it was that eye. I said it was that eye. And I landed on my backside. This is a god shoot that I'm telling you. Bang, bang, bang. I landed three times on my backside. And I looked up and I heard him say four, I think it was. But Jenny said four. I don't know what happened to one, two, or three. Vic Patrick retired to become a leading referee. Freddie Dawson, here annihilating Walter Haynes, was enormously popular in Australia. He had 21 fights down under for 21 wins and, during those bouts, returned home to lose a controversial 15-round title fight against world champ Ike Williams. After his final tour of Australia, Freddie Dawson went back to the south side of Chicago, blew most of his money and went blind. By the late 40s, Australia's population was just over 7.5 million and swelling with the intake of thousands of migrants from Britain and Europe. From Wales came the great lightweight Ronnie James for a bout with Tommy Burns. James set up camp by the beach at Coogee. With the Sydney trainer Snowy Robbins in his corner, the Welshman was a formidable opponent for Burns. Ronnie James had fought for the world title only four months earlier and against Burns, quickly showed his class. Look at that left. James is fast, all right. This is boxing at its best. 
unfortunately for the fans, the fight ended early when Burns unintentionally hit James when he was down. Referee Wallace declared James the winner on a foul. Burns couldn't hide his disappointment. After that loss, Tommy took out his frustrations against Hockey Bunnell. Bunnell weaves from side to side, but Burns worked into the ropes, and Bunnell's on the receiving end of some very heavy punches. Wow, look at that straight leg. Even this early, it's becoming apparent that youth will be served. Bunnell, though noted for his boxing skill, can do nothing to repel the onslaught. a beaten man. And as the bell goes, Bunnell follows Burns instead of going to his own corner. Seems to me that's the best place to be behind Burns. The fourth round is hardly started when referee Wallace crowns Burns World Cup Champion of Australia. Just one month later, Burns would fight the bout they still call the greatest ever held at Sydney Stadium. It was March the 3rd, 1947, and his opponent, the American shock puncher, O'Neill Bell. Tommy Burns was a massive draw card, and 14,000 people ensured both he and Stadiums Limited had another big payday. Very few fights have provided the sustained action that Burns Bell dished up. It was a ripper. He's going to take the lead, and it's the beginning of the end. Ron Sainbell. It's a question of when. It was a fight that uh, I would like to live through again. Good grief, my face was in such a mess, it was shaped like a soccer ball, and both my eyebrows were busted open. And the worst thing about it was that Albie, my trainer, couldn't drive a car, and I was living at Narrabeen with my friend Harry McGrath. So I'm driving, and every time I wanted to. Uh, to see anything like, you know, to see more clearly about to uh, this and, and don't forget there's stitches and these eyebrows are all stitched up. And very sore, I couldn't hardly touch my face. And this I finally I got back to Narrabeen. His good looks and free swinging style made Tommy the greatest crowd magnet the Sydney Stadium ever had. In 21 fights at the Old Barn, Burns sold the joint out 15 times. He looked great in belting Eddie Marcus. When Tommy's face was pretty again, he took time off from the ring and appeared in a movie, the Charles Chevelle epic Sons of Matthew. The girls swooned when Tommy got his gear off. And Chevelle just couldn't resist letting him sort out the bad guys. We're a peace-loving family, though, Riddens. Peace-loving, eh? <laughs> Tommy dreamed of acting in Hollywood and went there in 1949 on a trip sponsored by newspaper magnate Ezra Norton and even got to meet the original Tommy Burns. But when he came home, he was broke. By now, Australia had a car of its own. It was in the late 40s when Prime Minister Ben Shifley unveiled our first mass-produced automobile, the Holden. At White City, the school tennis championships were in full swing. Young players came from all And, little did we know, this young schoolboy tennis champ would become a legend. His name? Ken Rosewall. By the time the fabulous 50s rolled around, Fight crowds were packing into Sydney Stadium and the festival halls in Brisbane and Melbourne. Mickey Tollis was a tough kid from Newcastle who played rugby league and loved to fight. He chose boxing over football because in those days it meant a lot more money. His mum was his manager and she was also responsible for making those oversized trunks that used to cause a stir. Thomas 
performance in action in one of his best performances at Sydney Stadium, beating the brilliant Ken Bailey. Fred Hanabury's brother Bill did the counting. Meanwhile, Tommy Burns, in his bid to pay the bills, pulled on the gloves again and came up against Tollis. Tollis had in his corner Ambrose Palmer, but even the old master couldn't save him this night. Mickey Tollis had drawn with Burns and Patrick in better times, but after this bout, he would never fight again. And who will ever forget the most unlikely-looking main event a Sydney Stadium ever saw? Don Bronco Johnson, who had his own boxing and rodeo show in North Queensland. Johnson had won all nine fights in his first professional year and climbed into the ring to take on Tommy Burns on his comeback trail. This is one bout that still brings a twinkle to Tommy's eye. The fiercest five rounds I ever fought. He was a good bloke outside the ring, but inside the ring, you'd hit him with a, a full-blooded punch, and he would, ooh, he would grin and shake his head. He did this, I can remember it, he, oh, good, good punch. You know, that, like, a, he congratulates you on, on connecting with a good punch and grin, and then he would come at you from all angles. Three or four rounds, I tell you, with him was like, you know, uh, ten rounds with somebody else. This is round five, and Johnson getting ready. Burns keeps hammering him with body blows, and the Queenslanders in row in a bad way. He's going backward now, he's rigged the weak, he's an easy target. Burns begins to cut him down, catches him with a series of hard punches, and Johnson's down. And the begins to count. The Queen's hand is up again, but he's out on his feet as he stands against the ropes, breaking the end of the compulsory egg count. Johnson, same as ever, who lands the first punch. But it's his last effort, Burns tears him with scientific precision, each blow hurting. But Johnson, tough, he's out, but he won't go down. Bronco remembers it too. He thought he would be fighting some pretty boy mug there. Yeah, he's a good-looking Tommy Burns, oh yeah, he's supposed to be the uh, prominent Philip Star, and uh, I've still got some in this one, you know, <laughs> I'll knock him around a bit. Uh, after a couple of rounds or something, he's hanging in mind. Thought he was a lad, a good-looking lad, he was a, he was really a tough bird, that's for sure. Tommy Burns was laying on to me, just a, just a sick and steady as well, I was giving him, he's a tough fighter. Tommy Burns.